there are three malachim, travelers, wayfarers, sometimes translated as men or angels. The word malachim means messengers. Three messengers that, as I mentioned earlier, Abraham sees outside of his tent, and he goes to welcome them. And then later on, these messengers move on to the city of Sodom, where they receive a very different reception. At the beginning of the parsha of our Torah portion, we read, looking up, Abraham saw three people standing opposite him. Seeing them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to meet them, and bowing down to the ground, he said, My lords, if I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, then wash our feet, your feet and recline under a tree, and let me bring a bit of bread, and you can restore yourselves. Gracious hospitality is what Abraham offers to these three travelers. But in the next chapter, after they leave Abraham and they go to the city of Sodom, they meet Abraham's nephew, Lot, who greets them hospitably, insisting that they spend the night in his home. At first they refused, but Lot so pressed them that they followed him and entered his house, where he made them a festive meal, baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But outside, the rest of the people of Sodom didn't treat those travelers so hospitably. The people of Sodom hounded Lot and pressured him to turn the travelers over to them, presumably to harm them. As they said to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out so we can have them. When Lot refused, the townspeople tried to break down the door to pull the wayfarers out. We know that Sodom is destroyed by God because God is not able to even find ten righteous people who live there. What is the sin of Sodom? What did they do wrong? Mistakenly, there are those who thought that the evil behavior that the people of Sodom engage in is sodomy. But the text does not bear that out. According to Perkevot, the sayings of the sages, a text from 2,000 years ago, the wicked behavior of the Sodomites is selfishness, not sodomy. The rabbis define midat sdom, the quality of Sodom, to be what is mine is mine, and what is yours is yours. The Talmud teaches that Sodom is blessed with great wealth, but instead of sharing it, they prohibit helping foreigners who would only drain the resources. And another source shares that the people of Sodom proclaim that anyone who gives bread to the poor will be burned in fire. The sin of Sodom is clearly selfishness, which leads to its demise. What a contrast to the way those travelers were received so warmly and generously by Abraham. This past Wednesday night, we had quite an exceptional program in which we got to learn from the well-known sociologist Robert Putnam and his research assistant Shailen Romney Garrett about their new book called Upswing, how America came together a century ago, and how we can do it again. They did research about what were the most divisive times in our history of this country, and when did we come together and unite? And what they found is that the turn of the 20th century was a highly divisive time. It was on the heels of the Industrial Revolution, there were many disruptions in society, and our country was polarized at that time, economically, politically, and socially. And slowly from that period of time, at the beginning of the 20th century, up until the 1960s, we see a graph showing that we come together as a society, 
and that the 60s, at the beginning at least, were the least polarized time in our country. And now, 125 years after that last polarized time, we find that we are even more divided economically, politically, and socially. I know that's a big surprise to all of you living in this day and age, but it was interesting to actually see it graphed out. As Robert Putnam and Shailen Romney Garrett argue, the turn of the 20th century and our period of time now is a time of I, a focus on myself and my needs and my own group. As Pierre Caveau teaches, it's a time when our society most lived by the adage, what is mine is mine and what is yours is yours, midat stom, the quality of Sodom. And that's the time in which we're living now. The mid-century was a time instead of we, of coming together, of not being so polarized economically, politically, or socially. Of course, the irony of the 60s is that the black community, <clears throat> during the height of the least polarized time in our society, was demanding equal rights because they hadn't benefited from the we mentality as much as white Americans. They had benefited, just not quite as much. And during the civil rights movement, as we all know, there was a move to make sure that black citizens of this country would be treated with equity. But the decades that followed the civil rights movement in the 60s, there was a backlash. And now we see in our country the largest gap between rich and poor in our country's history Political divisiveness is at an all-time high, and we are divided socially as well. And the statistics bear it out. It's not just our experience. So what can we do about it? Romney Garrett and Putnam, they look back at how our country raised itself out of the divide the last time. And Shailen Romney Garrett said, we could think that the way that we got out of the situation last time is through the great social programs that we saw, beginning with the Social Security Act in 1935, followed by unemployment compensation aid, aid to dependent children, the creation of the Department of Health and Human Services, Housing and Urban Development, Department of Labor, Agriculture, Education, all these things that we know that happened in the early part of the 20th century. Shaylin argued something else. She said, before you had all of these great programs to help lift people out of poverty, to help to narrow the gap between rich and poor, to bring people together politically and socially, there was a precursor to this. And she said, the first thing that had to happen was a revolution in values. Yes, there were religious people and young people arguing the importance of taking care of each other, of not living in the eye, not being so selfish, but reaching out to others and making sure that others had what they needed. In Robert Putnam's last book that he wrote, American Grace, where Beth Emmett is featured, by the way, uh, this book came out in 2010, and Beth Emmett was interviewed for this book about 15 years ago by Shailen Romney Garrett. And the reason, actually, that Robert Putman came to Beth Emmett and asked if we could be part of his book about religion is because he converted to Judaism with Rabbi David Polish, our founding rabbi, and married somebody who grew up here at Beth Emmett. And now he's, of course, become probably the most prominent sociologist of religion and um, one of the most prominent sociologists uh, in general in our country. And so we met him at that time, and we got to meet Shailen as well when she came to be embedded with us for three weeks during that High Holy Day period. But what is argued in American Grace? What Shailen and Robert found out was that those who affiliate with religious institutions are more altruistic. Among a list of demographic and ideological characteristics, education, age, income, gender, race, etc., Religion is the strongest predictor of altruism. 
Altruistic values predict secular giving, not just religious giving, and volunteering, working on community projects and other measures of good neighborliness. I quote, once we know how observant a person is in terms of church or attendance at other religious institutions, nothing that we can discover about the content of her religious faith adds anything to our understanding of her good neighborliness. Nothing about her views about the Bible or life after death or evolution or eschatology or her personal experience of God or the kind of God she believes in or the importance of religion in her life or in her personal or political decisions or her views about morality or salvation or evolution or anything else. What matters is not what we believe, but if we're involved in religious networks. Those who are involved in religious networks, in particular religious institutions, are more generous. Fascinating. Why is that? Well, one of, one of their hypotheses is that in these religious networks, people are asked more frequently to give and volunteer. Sound familiar? Karen Isaacson, the president of our congregation, who asked people to give and volunteer all the time. But apparently, when we live in, within religious communities and we ask each other to step up, that it helps us to be more generous, not just to our own institution, not just to other religious institutions, but to be better citizens in general in secular society as well. Of course, the underbelly that we know about religious life is that some who are religious particularly fundamentalists, can be less tolerant for civil liberties and political dissent. But in every other measure, those who affiliate with religious institutions are better and more generous in society. My hypothesis about religious organizations also being more open to civil liberties is when religious organizations support things like LGBTQ rights or anti-racism, we find that there is a move forward in our society on these issues. And I think that that is what we have seen. When religious institutions are not open to those changes, it makes it harder. But when we see that they are, we see a, a momentum forward. Putnam and Romney Garrett's sociology research has confirmed, though, what we who are affiliated with religious institutions already know, and what Abraham taught us, lo, those many years ago, when he ran out of his tent and he brought those travelers in and fed them a good meal and allowed them to spend the night. Abraham taught us the importance of gracious hospitality, the importance of including everyone in the tent, running out to greet those who are in need, to be active in pursuit of caring for others, not just waiting to hear when somebody needs us. Selfishness. This was the sin of Sodom. The value of gracious hospitality. This is the quality of Abraham. We are at a crossroads in our society today. Will we live by Midat Stone? the selfishness of the people of Sodom, or will we live by midat chesed, the quality of loving kindness that Abraham teaches us, Abraham our ancestor who began our faith? What will we choose? Well, I certainly hope here at Beth Emmet that we choose that quality of Abraham, that with the change of values, a change of heart, we'll see that graph that Shailen Romney Garrett and Robert Putnam has showed is very low and to begin to inch up and to create a society in which the divisiveness will begin to dissipate and where everyone will share in the economic and social improvement in our society. This is what Abraham has modeled for us. May this be the way that we live in our community and in our lives and in our congregation. Amen. Continue together on page 586 of Sui.